In 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter in verse 17, Paul would write, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When we look at the background of this passage, the Apostle Paul had been dealing with one of his favorite themes, actually. That is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ. And he had been arguing, as he oftentimes did, that Christ's death on the cross was not an end of itself. That wasn't all that there was to it, everything. That Christ died upon the cross and that's it. Now, a lot of times in listening to denominational people today, you would think that that was it. That Christ's death upon the cross, that took away all sins, past, future, past, present, or future sins. And nothing else matters after that. But obviously, as you read what Paul writes, that's not the case. The death of Christ was not all that there was. Obviously, it is the central point of history because it is that which takes away the sins of the world. But that's not all there is to it. In fact, if you don't have three days later a resurrection from the dead, that death means nothing. He was proven, Romans 1 and verse 4, to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. But as you read 1 Corinthians 15, even that's not the final aspect, nor the central point, because it was a necessary step in relationship to a new glorified life. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, while in the first four verses we have that gospel presented to us, how that verse 3, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures. Verse 5 starts out by saying, and that he was seen. So there's the new life, the glorified life. And he goes through the several of the resurrection appearances of Jesus after his resurrection. But coming back to our text here in 2 Corinthians 5, it is true that Christ died upon the cross, that he was raised. But now then, Paul's point is in relationship to man, we also must die and be raised. In Romans, the sixth chapter, Paul, in writing to these Roman Christians, and by the way, he was writing to Christians at this time. He was not writing to those individuals who were not Christians, and he's reminding them of certain aspects and he asked them the question, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? There were some who were obviously arguing, as it sounds a lot like many today, who teach the false doctrine of once saved, always saved. But they were teaching, well, since God's grace is, overcomes our sins, we need to sin more and more and more so God's grace will be more abundant. So he asked the question. It's a rhetorical question that expects a negative answer. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now he answers it. King James says, God forbid. Well, I kind of like that phraseology. <clears throat> 
the correct translation would be, may it never be, is the correct translation instead of God forbid, even though I like God forbid. How can, it, how can you even think of such an idea? Why? Because, and this is what he's going to go on to show, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You died to sin. And yet now then you're arguing we need to continue to sin? How foolishness. And so he goes back. Know ye not, verse 3, that so many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we should be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. And henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. He reminds them of their baptism. Again, he's not trying to argue the necessity of baptism here. They've already been baptized for the remission of their sins. These individuals had already become Christians. Now, we oftentimes use this verse to show the necessity of baptism in becoming a Christian, and rightly so. But that's not Paul's argument here. You're arguing we should sin more and more so that grace can continue to abound and have abundant grace. Don't you know what your baptism was all about? That's why he's telling them. In baptism, you died to that old man of sin, that old life. Now, then, how in the world can you now argue that we should continue in sin, to live in sin? You have been died to that old man of sin in baptism, and then, even as Christ was raised from the dead, we also are raised from that spiritual death to walk in newness of life. In that death, in regards to baptism then, and this is what verse 7, you're freed from sin. In that act of baptism, you are freed from sin. Why are you going to continue to live in it? You can't do such and be a Christian and what a Christian means. Sometimes, uh, and I know that Paul many times has talked about this, that uh, the word Christian and the word uh, or the idea that we're nothing but sinners well, if we're nothing but sinners, then we're not Christians because Christians are not sinners. Now then, don't misunderstand that we're living a sinless life. There's a difference between someone continuing in sin, living in sin, and someone who's living the Christian life, who will, yes, because of weakness and frailty of human life, and because of their will, they will fall and stumble at times. They will commit sin within their life. But that's not their lifestyle. And that's what Paul is saying here. Yes, the grace of God is available to us to save us from our sins, to cleanse those times in which we stumble and fall. But that's not our lifestyle. How can you say we're going to continue in sin or using that phraseology, we're nothing but sinners. Don't you remember what your baptism was all about? It was to change your lifestyle from being that sinner to being a Christian. You've been freed from sin. In Colossians, the third chapter, in verse 1, he says, If ye then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. The idea, if ye be risen with Christ. That goes back to our baptism again. 
And while it's not elaborated upon here in uh, Colossians, the third chapter, even back into the second chapter, although if you go back to chapter 2 and verse 12, it does discuss that. But he's really, uh, he's dealing with our baptism. Here's someone who has been baptized, and in that baptism, what's happening? They're being raised with Christ. That's what Romans 6 and verse 4 that we just read says. That, that even though we have been buried with him by baptism in Christ, we, like as Christ, are raised from the dead. So we are not to live in sin. We're not to continue in sin. We walk in newness of life. Here he uses that phrase, you've been risen with Christ, what are we to do? Seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. We are to seek spiritual matters not the matters of this world. Sometimes through the years, you hear someone who tells this moral individual, all you need to do is be baptized and in effect, you don't have to change your life. Well, yes, they do. Because that's what Christianity is all about. Their life prior to being a Christian, even though they might be living a moral life, even though they might be doing good deeds within their life, their life is still a physical life. It's centered upon the physical, this world. And when you're raised with Christ, you're no longer seeking those things. You're now seeking spiritual matters. That's what Christianity is all about. Seeking those things that are above where Christ sits, not the things of this world. And so, and again, using the words of our text, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Sadly, far too many professed Christians never understand that very basic principle of all things are become new. We'll get to that later on in this lesson, probably next Sunday morning, Lord willing. But I want us to look at this phrase, in Christ. Because... A lot of times when people see that phrase, in Christ, they immediately think of, of a Christian. That's not always the case. Um, it instead has to deal with an approved or an acceptable relationship as far as God is concerned. To use an equivalent phrase, for example, in Ephesians 6 and verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord. That's in Christ. Does that mean that you only obey your, ch your parents if they're, your parents are Christians? Now, if in the Lord has, carries that idea, then that's what that verse is teaching, but that's not what that verse is teaching. It's saying, you children, obey your parents. Why? Because that is an approved relationship with God. That's what God expects. That's what God has authorized you to do as children. And so when we're looking at that phrase, in Christ, it's dealing with that approved, acceptable relationship with God, or to God. It is many times referred to as a monogram of Paul because he uses it so many times. At least 132 times Paul uses it in his writings. He uses it obviously more than any other inspired writers do, do even though it is used at other times by inspired writers. Let's look at a few examples of this in Paul's writings. Romans the 8th chapter and verse 1. Paul would write 
There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are, which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That idea of not walking after the flesh, but after the Spirit, that's what we were talking about just a moment ago. It's that individual who's not looking to this physical world as far as his outlook on life, but his mind now is turned to spiritual matters. He's seeking those things that are above. He's no longer walking after the flesh. He's walking after the spirit. Now in the spirit here is dealing with, as you go through Romans the 8th chapter, God's word. That word that has been revealed to the apostles by the Holy Spirit. John 14, 25 and 26 and John 16, 12 and verse 13. The Spirit revealed that word to the apostles. They wrote it down in Ephesians, Ephesians 3 and verse 3 and 4, or through 5 actually, so that when we read it, we can understand that mystery of Christ, that will of God. Now then, there's the Spirit. We're walking after that which the Spirit has authorized and has commanded within His Word, the New Testament. We're not after walking after the flesh. But he says in relationship to that individual who is in Christ, there's no condemnation. Condemnation does not come upon this individual. Why? Because he's in Christ. He's not condemned. Here in our text in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, we learn an important lesson that therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. There's that aspect of being a new creature in Christ. Since he is a new creature, obviously the old things are passed away, all things are become new, but he's a new creature in Christ Jesus. And we tie that in in relationship to what Paul writes to the Galatians in Galatians 3 and verse 26. For ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And I add here, our King James translators did not do us a favor when it, they translated, uh, you're all children of God by faith. They left out the definite article. And they should have included it. It is literally, for you're all children of God by the faith. It's not talking about our own personal faith, our own belief system. That's not why he has reference to. We are children of God by the faith. The faith having reference to the word of God. Or we could say the scriptures, the New Testament. So we're children of God by the word of God as we're in Christ Jesus. But our relationship with God now, being in Christ, based upon the word of God, is that we are his children. We're a child of God. And we might add, just very briefly here, as being children of God, we are heirs of God, of all that God gives unto his children and all he blesses his children with. In Ephesians 1 and verse 7, and again repeated in Colossians 1 and verse 14, he says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. In Ephesians he adds, according to the riches of his grace. So in whom, here again, while not using Christ, it's whom has reference to Christ within the context of both of these passages. So in Christ, in whom we have, he says, redemption. That redemption, of course, comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. We have, in the song that we sing many times, redeemed. We've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul is saying in these passages. We have, because we're in Christ, the forgiveness of our sins. 
Now again, while some individuals try to make this applicable to future sins, it's not talking about future sins, it's our past sins. For example, when we are baptized, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of all past sins. It does not cleanse us of future sins, there's something else we have to do in relationship to be forgiven of those future sins that we commit. That when we commit those, we repent of our sins, we confess them and pray to God as we see in, Coloss or in Acts 8 chapter, verse 22 and following, and 1 John 1 and verse 9. And, but he's talking about we have the forgiveness of our sins. Those sins that we have committed within our life, they've been forgiven. They've been taken away. The idea of remission and forgiveness, actually the two words in our English come from the same Greek word. It means the same thing. We have remission. We have forgiveness. What is it? Those sins have been taken away by the blood of Jesus Christ. And thus we have forgiveness. We have thus redemption in Christ Jesus. In 2 Timothy, the second chapter, and verse 10, Paul would say, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. We've been saved. That salvation that will bring eternal glory is found, though, in Christ. If I am in Christ, then I'm saved. If I am in Christ when I die, because we realize the fact that we can get out of Christ, we can leave that fort of safety using the language of Peter in 1 Peter, the, fifth, the first chapter, we can leave, that's our choice, but as long as I am within Christ or in Christ, I have eternal salvation when I die, eternal glory when I die. I'll be able to spend an eternity with God in heaven. Why? Because I'm in Christ Jesus. In Ephesians, the first chapter and verse 3, Paul would sum up this very beautifully when he says blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ or in the heavenlies in Christ so here in Christ again we have literally all spiritual blessings we could say as well that there are no spiritual blessings then outside of Christ. All spiritual blessings are found in that, and it's a location is what he's using in Christ, in that location of being in Christ, then all spiritual blessings are found there. No spiritual blessings are outside of Christ. And so... We need to find out, we need to ask the question, if we have all of these blessings in Christ, that there's no condemnation in Christ, that we become a new creature in Christ, that we're children of God in Christ, that we have redemption in Christ, we have the forgiveness of sins in Christ, we have salvation in Christ, we have all spiritual blessings in Christ. How do we get there? Isn't that the place we want to be? Isn't that the location where we want to be? It should be. As you read your New Testaments, how we get into Christ is only found in two locations. The first of those is Romans 6 chapter that we read just a moment ago in verses 1 through 7, when verses 3 and 4 in particular, he tells us how we get into Christ. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? 
Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. He says we've been baptized into Jesus Christ. Now in Christ is where we have all these blessings. How do we get in there? How do we get into that location? He says it's by baptism. And when we are baptized in water, signifying that death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, we are getting into that location where all of spiritual blessings exist. And then in Galatians 3 and verse 27, while well, in verse 26 we see that we're children of God by the word of God, by the faith in Christ Jesus, he then says, verse 27, for as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. How do we get into that location where we are a child of God? It's through the word of God teaching us to be baptized and in that act of baptism we are getting into that location where we are now a child of God. That's what Paul is teaching there. But it's also that location where all spiritual blessings exist. Before you are baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins, for that purpose that God gives, you have absolutely no spiritual blessings. You're separated from all of them. Once you get into Christ, through that act of baptism, you now have all spiritual blessings available to you. Well, I notice, though, some comparisons that we find in the passages that we've read. For example, we read in Romans 8 and verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. We find that in Christ thus, one of those spiritual blessings is that we have no condemnation. We do not stand condemned before God in Christ Jesus. Turn over, though, with me to 1 Peter, the third chapter, and verse 21 in particular, where Paul would, or Peter would write the like figure. And really, this is a word which, you know, we went through our lectureship on type and antitype. The word here that's the like figure is literally antitype. It's a Greek word, antitupos. The antitype. What is the antitype? Or what's the type? The type is, found in verse 20, how that Noah and Nate souls were saved by water. So you have water salvation. The antitype is baptism doth also now save us. What's the purpose of baptism? It's not to show that we've already been saved as the denominational world wants us to believe. But it is that act that saves us. But now notice, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. In other words, that water salvation, that water baptism is not simply taking a physical bath to wash away the dirt of the body. Instead, it is the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want us to look at, in comparison specifically to what we were noticing, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. When one has a good conscience that we find in 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, that this act of baptism that saves us is the answer of a good conscience toward God. When we have a good conscience toward God, we do not have condemnation. They are saying essentially the same thing. When one is standing condemned before God, he does not have a good conscience. 
The only way to have that good conscience is to be in Christ. The only way to be not to have no condemnation is to be saved in water baptism. They're saying the same thing. They're equivalent. They're showing us that in Christ Jesus that we get into through that act of baptism, we have a good conscience. We have no condemnation before God. Baptism is that act that places us into that place where we have no condemnation. It is that act that places us within that location to where we have a good conscience before God. In our text that we were using this morning, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. In Christ, we are a new creature, Paul says. But notice in Romans 6 chapter, again, that which we read, but notice verse 4 in particular this time. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Walking in newness of life and being a new creature is exactly the same thing. And he says, in Christ you are a new creature. In Romans 6, he says, when we're baptized into Christ, we're walking in newness of life. We could just change the wording a little bit. That therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is walking in newness of life. Or in Romans 6 and verse 4, that in that act of baptism, we're raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, that even as Christ was, that we also should be a new creature. You see the same ideas being presented in different terms. In Christ, we are a new creature. How do we get there? It's in that act of baptism that we get into Christ. Notice in Galatians, the third chapter, We read in verse 26, For ye are all children of God by, again, the faith in Christ Jesus. And then we noted verse 27 just a moment ago, For as many of you as been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. The word for can be translated from different Greek words. One of them, is the Greek word ace or ice, depending on whose pronunciation you go by. The Greek word ace always is looking forward. It can properly be translated unto or in order to. It's the word found, for example, in Matthew 26 and verse 28. When Jesus says, this is the blood of of the New Testament, which is shed for many for, ace, the remission of sins. I am shedding my blood so that you will have, in order to have the remission of sin, or unto the remission of sins. It's looking forward to the remission of sins that he's shedding his blood for. That's the same word used in Acts 2 and verse 38 when Peter says, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. It's that word ace. Ace, the remission of sins. Here's what you must do in order to have future tense, the remission of your sins. What is it? You must repent and be baptized. Now that's one word that's translated for. There's another word, and by the way, the word ace or ice is not the word used in Galatians 3.27. The other word is gar. And it means, here's the reason. 
it's showing in this context when he says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We could substitute the phrase, here's how one becomes a child of God, verse 26. Ye are all children of God by the faith in Christ Jesus. Here's how you became a child of God, by being baptized into Christ. In that act of baptism, thus, you are becoming a child of God. Which is what you have when you're in Christ Jesus. Which is what that act of baptism places you into. We also have redemption, the forgiveness of sins in Christ Jesus, Roman, or Ephesians 1 and verse 7, and Colossians 1 and verse 14, that in whom, in Christ, we have the redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. But that forgiveness of sins, that redemption, is found or is applied in the act of baptism as we would see in Acts 2 and verse 38, which we read just a moment ago, as Peter responded to the people, to the Jews' questions, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for, again, that Greek word "ace" or ice, looking forward to the remission of your sins. If you want the remission of your sins, here is what you have to do. You have to repent, be baptized. But we have the forgiveness of sins in Christ Jesus. That act of baptism is that which gives us the forgiveness of our sins. It's what places us into Christ. In 2 Timothy in 2 and verse 10 that we read, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here's salvation in Christ Jesus. That's what we have as a blessing of being in Christ. But again, the application is found in the act of baptism. We read 1 Peter 3 and verse 21 just a moment ago. That the like figure, wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism saves us. Denominational world comes along, and while they might not state it in this passage, they teach it that baptism doth not save us. Peter says baptism saves us. What is it? We have salvation in Christ Jesus. We have salvation when we're baptized into Christ. Prior to that baptism, there is absolutely no salvation. We're lost, we're condemned, because we're outside of Christ. And in that act of baptism, it is that act which takes us from that lost state to that saved state. It saves us. No wonder Jesus would tell his apostles in giving them the great commission that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16 and verse 16. What does it take to be saved? It takes, yes, belief. And all that that involves. But then you add to that. That's the idea of and. It's joining two things together. Belief and baptism in order to be saved. That's the individual who shall be saved. Why? Because baptism doth also now save us. We have forgiveness in Christ Jesus. And we get into Christ in that act of baptism. Denominational world comes along and says, He that believeth shall be saved and then should be baptized. No, that's not what scriptures teach. Verse 
Scriptures teach that baptism is necessary for our salvation. That that's that act that takes us from that lost state and places us into that saved state. Then to sum it up, as we said in Ephesians 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That phrase, in the heavenly places, or literally, in the heavenlies, has reference, if you study Ephesian, the rest of Ephesian letter, to the church. That in, it is dealing with in the church. We have all spiritual blessings in the church in Christ. If you study again, Hebrews the 8th chapter and the 9th chapter, Paul shows that the heavenly places doesn't simply refer to heaven, but it has reference to the church. In Ephesians 1, 22 and verse 23, Paul would say that God hath put all things under Christ's feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The church is the fullness of Christ. And thus, when you're being baptized into Christ, you're being baptized into the church where all spiritual blessings are received. Or to use the language of Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Body being the church again, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 and Colossians 1 and verse 18. And he adds, whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink in one spirit. How do we get into the church? Paul says you're baptized into the church. You're baptized into the body. That body being the, the church, being the fullness of Christ, where we now have all spiritual blessings. Do you want that salvation that's found in Christ Jesus? It takes baptism. Now, that baptism is not simply that's all that there is to it. It must be upon our proper faith. We believe that Christ is, that God is, that Christ is his son. He died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried and that he rose again the third day. We believe those things. We repent of our sins. That repentance is that decision of mine to no longer walk after the flesh but now to walk after the spirit. I'm going to no longer live according to the things of this world. I'm now going to live for God and do the things that God would have me to do within my life. It's going to be seen or reflected in one's actions, but it starts in that decision of the mind. Repentance. We make a confession of our faith in Jesus Christ as being the Son of God, as the Ethiopian did in Acts 8, chapter and verse 37. And then we're prepared, we're now ready for that act of baptism that takes us and places us into Christ where we have salvation where we have redemption of our sins, where we have no condemnation, where we have literally all spiritual blessings. Now, if you have not been baptized for the remission of your sins this morning, we would encourage you to obey that, that gospel of Jesus Christ. Or if you need to come back and be restored to faithfulness to him, why not do so this morning as we stand and sing the invitation song?